session on uh, Derosio's poems that are included in your syllabus. Uh, one on the slave and on the other, uh, the other on the orphan girl. Now, uh, before I move on to a discussion of the poems proper, I'd just like to mention, as you might have seen in my earlier lectures on Derosio, which are uploaded on YouTube, about Derosio's fascination with the upliftment of India. He acknowledged India as his own native land his own identity as an Eurasian was imprinted upon this identity of the Indian. And therefore, Derosio's concept was to uplift India from its uh, rut that it had fallen into due to practices of orthodoxy and superstition. Now, around Derosio, of course, you know that the young Bengal movement flourished. And the young, movement, the young Bengal movement was marked by quite a number of features. What were the features of this young Bengal movement that we should very carefully note before we uh, sort of uh, go into the poems proper? The first was that Derosio emphasized that students should think for themselves. This was their sacred duty. So individual rationality. Second, a freedom and a free exchange of ideas and that everybody should express clearly what they felt. Thirdly, he encouraged students to read outside the syllabus, especially books which talked about social upliftment. And fourth, he talked about truth and virtue as the cardinal sort of principles that the young Bengal movement should follow. Now, importantly, Derosio's idea of the uh, of freedom, especially, was grafted in his schooling, in his education at Drummond's Academy in Dharamtala, where, you know, Derosio was reading, amongst others, the poetry of Shelley, Byron, as well as the literature of Tom Paine. And in a short piece, when he had to remember great names and their influences, Derosio recollected Bacon, Milton, Locke, Stewart, Shelley, and Isaac Newton. Therefore, the spirit of freedom and democracy was you know, drummed into Derosio right from his initial education. And this was what drew him to the phenomenon of slavery and the freedom from slavery. Now, if I take a look at the practice of slavery and the calls for abolition, we see that by 1780, Pennsylvania in America had already announced the abolition of slavery. This is 1780. 1787, if you can, please note down the dates or maybe take them down later on so that we have a chronology of why Derosio was writing this particular poem, Freedom to the Slave. But in 1787, Britain started the Society for Effecting the Abolition of the Slave Trade. Now, this was in turn called by Thomas Paine's and Thomas Paine, if you remember, had was a Britisher who had emigrated to Pennsylvania and was one of the major, you know, polemical theorists about the freedom from slavery. And in March 1775, he wrote an essay about the end of slavery. So 1775, Paine's idea, 1780. Pennsylvania outlaws slavery. 1787, in Britain, there is the Society for the Abolition of Slavery. Remember that at this point of time, America was probably uh, moving ahead in its 
abolition of slavery, especially the northern states were all in favor of the abolition of slavery. France, of course, had initiated this also uh, with the French Revolution. But then the arrival of Napoleon in 1802, you know, it caused a return to some of the slaving uh, trade. But by and large, across Europe and America, this discourse about the freedom from slavery and the emancipation of the slaves was being articulated very vociferously. 1794, of course, France abolishes slavery. And I said in 1802, it is revoked and slavery is brought back again, practically because of Napoleon. 1807, the UK, the United Kingdom, outlaws slave trade. So there's no freedom to the slaves as such, but Britain by this time is outlawing the slave trade. Now, slavery was to be abolished in Britain in 1833. Derosio, by the way, writes this poem, particular poem, Freedom to the Slave. In 1827, it's published in his first anthology of poems called, uh, just titled Poems. Six years after this, slavery is completely abolished in Britain. And in 1865, after a very bloody civil war, the United States of America abolishes slavery. So that is then a kind of a timeline of slavery. So you could say that from 1775 to 1827, you know, the movement against slavery had begun in great earnest. And England was on the verge of announcing uh, the freedom from slavery, the abolition of slavery, uh, to be more precise, which would come in 1833. Therefore, this is the context within which De Rosio was writing the poem Freedom to the Slave. Now, before I move on to other texts that dealt with the same topic, I would like to also emphasize that the idea of freedom was critical to Derosio both in Drummond school and also in the Young Bengal movement. Therefore, Derosio was looking at several aspects of freedom. Now, we know that he was greatly influenced by the French Revolution. We know that he was greatly influenced by the American Revolution and the writings of Tom Paine. In my lecture on Derosio, his life and times, you will find that Tom Paine's book had entered the Calcutta book market uh, in great numbers and had influenced a large number of uh, people during this time. Now, uh, this was also, of course, immensely aided by the fact that Derosio was also looking at another kind of freedom, the freedom of the people from the uh, or the freedom of the women from uh, their state of uh, their state of subjugation. So there are two themes of freedom which Derosio brings into the poetry. One is the idea of freedom in general and especially of slaves. And the other is the freedom of women from their state of subjugation, especially in Indian society. And Derosio is writing a number of poems, as you've seen, on the abolition of sati, for example, and on uh, the state of women in general. The Fakir of Jangira, of course, remains Derosio's major work in this direction. Now, having said that, therefore, I've just pointed out two things. One is that by 1789, Europe is in a state of churning, the desire for freedom becoming liberty, equality and fraternity becoming one of the buzzwords. We've already had Voltaire, we've already had England giving uh, a significant amount of rights to the citizen. We've had the French Revolution, we've had the American Revolution of 1776. And therefore, 
the entire atmosphere of Europe at this time is marked by this demand for freedom. Right. Now, for India especially, although De Rosio does not really look at, you know, any significant freedom struggle, but he posits his identity as the as an Indian, he's looking at, you know, the concept of freedom for his people in the sense that they should be free from dogma, that they should be free from the corrupt practices, especially uh, that of Sati, and that Indian women should be given far more liberation. And I'll talk uh, in a little while about the contribution of the young Bengal towards the emancipation of women when we come to this uh, poem, The Orphan Girl. But before that, let me move on to uh, the text of the freedom to the slave. And where was, you know, De Rosio coming from? Or where was this literature of the freedom for the slave coming from? And I'm going to argue that De Rosio was largely dependent upon a significant body of English literature that argued about the freedom of the, for the slave. And the one poet whom I'm going to go back to and take to his two of his poems for you to read is Campbell. Now, De Rosio was, of course, greatly influenced by the uh, Romantic writers. And therefore, uh, one of the major texts that he comes to talk about is The Pleasures of Hope. Now, if you take a look at the, the text here, you will find that uh, the first line of freedom to the slave uh, is taken from Campbell. As the slave departs, the man returns. Now, this is the source of the poem, right? The Pleasures of Hope. This was published by Thomas Campbell in 1799. And you see, at the back of this was this idea of the subjectivity of the slave. Now, there was this idea of compensation, especially when a slave ship died and how much money was the slave worth and what kind of subjectivity did he enjoy. So there was a prevalent idea that the slave was not human, fully human, as it were. He was only three-fourth human. Right. So the major 18th century romantic poets, and please remember that this is the, the, even before, you know, Shelley and Wordsworth and Coleridge and Keats, Campbell and the others were arguing against slavery. So slavery had entered into the realm of poetry to a significant exchange. And Campbell writes, if you can see uh, your text there, where barbarous hordes and Scythian mountains roam, truth, mercy, <coughs> freedom, yet shall find a home. So you can see the gamut of ideas that De Rosio is drawing upon from Campbell. Wherever degraded nature bleeds and pines, from Guinea's coast to Siberia's dreary mines, that's Siberia, right? So right across the globe, wherever there is slavery, Truth shall pervade the unfathomed darkness there. You see how slavery is associated with a sense of imprisonment and darkness, the dungeon of slavery, as it were, and light the dreadful features of despair. Once again, if you look at that, it's a reference to uh, the Dantesque hell, despair ye who enter here. Uh, in that sense, therefore, Campbell is drawing upon a large number of illusions of the dungeon, of the concept of hell, when he talks about slavery. Hark the stern captive spurns his heavy load. So once again, the load, the slave who's sort of buckling down under the load of the oppressor and throwing it away and asks the image back that heaven bestowed. So the form that, you know, all men were made in equality by the gods. Now, one of the major group of, uh, you know, religious preachers who were advocating the equality of men and therefore calling upon 
uh, for the abolition of slavery was the Quakers. And, you know, there's this, again, this concept of equality, which is worked in this poem, asks the image back that heaven bestowed, the image uh, uh, that, you know, in the sense that God made man in his own image and everybody is equal. Fears in his eyes, the fire of valor burns. Now, DeRosio's poem, too, will talk about this, this concept of bravery, valor, resistance, and so on and so forth. And you have that line which uh, DeRosio quotes. And as the slave departs, the man returns. Right. So as the, there's a kind of, you know, departure and arrival. Right. In the sense that, you know, the identity of the slave, the mantle of the slave, or you can say the chains of the slave are broken so that a new birth takes place. You know, this concept of a new arrival, new birth, is something is an image that DeRosio will bring back into his poetry. And I'll take this a little further and read another poem by Campbell so, you, so that you can understand the extent to which slavery was dominating the literary landscape of the period. Uh, Campbell writes, eternal nature, when thy giant hand had heaved the floods and fixed the trembling land, when life sprung startling at thy plastic call. So there is the reference back to the genesis, as it were. And the way in which, you know, from chaos, the cosmos was created. Say, was that lordly form inspired by thee to wear eternal chains and bow the knee? Now, that is a very powerful agreement in the sense that it brings Christian logic into the free form of man and asks as to whether slavery was created by God. And therefore, slavery is seen as a human institution which is antithetical to both Christianity and political equality. So there's a very conscious sort of combination of the Christian and the secular in the argument against slavery. Was man ordained the slave of man to toil, yoked with brutes and fettered to the soil? Once again, the image of the chain and the slave as a brute rather than a full man. As I said, the slave was not considered fully human in his subjectivity. No nature stamped us in a heavenly mold. She bade no wretch his thankless labor urge, nor trembling take the pittance and the scourge. So slaves were very frequently whipped. So he's suggesting once again that the burden and the whip was not the slave's uh, state at the beginning of civilization. No homeless Libyan in this stormy deep to call upon his country's name and weep. Lo, once in triumph. So, you know, the free man enslaved on his boundless plain, the quivered chief of Congo loved to reign. So he's talking about this pre-slavery status where, you know, the chief of Congo, most of the slaves were brought from Africa. Uh, not, not most, but almost all slaves were born, brought from Africa at this point of time. So this this concept of a free Africa, which is now bound with fires proportioned to his native sky, strength in his arm and lightning in his eye. So there are two kinds of states. One is the pre-slavery state, which is marked by freedom, health, bravery, valor. And the other is the post-slavery state, which is burdened, weak, and scourged. Scouted with wild feet, his sun illumined zone, the spear, the lion, and the woods, his own. So, you know, man in his surroundings and nature completely free. So, friendless thy heart, and canst thou harbor there? Uh, I'm sorry, let me just take you back to this, this line. That funeral dirge to darkness hath resigned. So, the freedom, the state of freedom, is contrasted with a binary state of darkness. Poor fettered, fettered man. So the image of the slave in chains. 
the wildness versus the chain slave. Now, remember these metaphors. Why am I going on and on about Campbell? Because <coughs> the series of metaphors that Derosio will be using are all, you know, taken from this kind of a discourse and the images that are associated with the slave. I hear the whispering low, unhallowed voice to guilt, the child of who? <coughs> Friendless thy heart, canst thou harbor here a wish but death, a passion but despair? So once again, you know, the state, uh, the state of the slave as completely marked in a Dantesque concept of despair and death. Right, so two binary states, one of slavery and the other of freedom, one of pre-slavery and the other of the slave. Now, Derosio will not talk about the pre-slave condition. He will rather talk about the moment, and he's imagining this moment, especially because that discourse is already there. You'll remember that in America, the northern states are already abolishing slavery, giving emancipation to the slaves. And there's this railroad network whereby, you know, through the railroad, slaves are gradually fleeing to the north and getting emancipated. Right, so Derosio is writing within this entire atmosphere, really, when the end of slavery is near. And therefore, he's imagining this moment when the slave has this emancipation, has his subjectivity. So he's no longer three fourths a man, but a full man. And therefore, as the slave departs, the man returns. The poem begins with that. So created an extensive sort of literary background through which, you know, Derosio can appear at this moment. So how felt he when he first was told a slave he sees to be? So he's imagining the state of mind, the subjectivity of the slave, the moment when, you know, you know, this news of his freedom, the statement that he's free, sort of is given to him. So is this, this very concept of rebirth once again, that uh, <clears throat> a new state of consciousness that Derosio will be talking about, how proudly beat his heart when first he knew that he was free. So you can see the kind of lyrical eloquence that Derosio brings, the dramatization of the moment of the knowledge of freedom. So, you see, from the broader perspective of the idea of the freedom of the slave, Derosio is transferring this to the poetic moment of the individual perception of the slave. From the broader debate about slavery, what the poet has done is he is projecting or he's delving into the moment where the first news of his emancipation comes to the slave. To noblest feelings of the soul, to glow at once began. He knelt no more. His thoughts were raised. To glow at once began. You see, once again, that familiar trope of light and darkness. You see, the literature of slavery was marked by several binaries, light, darkness, despair, hope. You see, the Campbell's poem, of course, is called The Pleasures of Hope, right? So hope versus despair, light versus darkness, freedom versus chains, right? Therefore, to glow at once began, he knelt no more. So kneeling versus upright, the slave is no longer kneeling. He's, he's upright in that sense, straight. He's, the man has returned, the slave has departed. He felt himself a man. So it is as it were from the womb of slavery, the free man has stepped into the world. And therefore what Derosio is recurrently using is this image of the rebirth. He looked above, 
the breath of heaven around him freshly blew. Now, what De Rosio will do after this dramatized moment when the first news comes about his emancipation, he will draw upon a series of natural metaphors. We draw upon a series of natural metaphors, which will talk about, you know, free flow. If you look at nature, then the images that De Rosio will be talking about is the free flowing waterfall and spring, the free flowing breeze, something that can move across without any hindrance. So the slaves subjectivity is now liberated like the stream of the air. It is no longer constrained. So the image of the rebirth then projected upon the image of total freedom within nature. So the breath of heaven around him freshly blew. He smiled exultingly to see as the wild birds as they flew. So the breeze, the wild bird, the flight of the wild bird and the flight of the slave's soul, as it were. He looked upon the running stream that neath him rolled away. So you see a cluster of metaphors, as it were. So the first section, the news, the dramatized moment of the news and the new consciousness. The second cluster talks about images associated with nature of air, birds and the stream, which all symbolize the free flowing personality. Then thought and winds and birds and floods and cried. So this is the this is the triumphant cry of the slave from the moment of realization to the announcement of subjectivity. And I'm free as they of oh freedom. Now, this is where the first segment of the poem ends. You see, with the clarion call of the slave's freedom. But from this point onwards, the poem meanders on, takes a different direction. And it then becomes a poem that ponders and reflects on the notion of freedom. And sort of generalizes from the individual state of the slave, it generalizes the very concept of freedom itself. Oh, freedom, there is something dear even in thy name that lights the altar of the soul with everlasting flame. So freedom is associated with enlightenment. And you can see the the ideas of the enlightenment, the freedom from dogma, emancipation from false reason is what De Rosio is falling back upon. But then there's another small movement and De Rosio is no longer talking about the slave's freedom. He will now talk about the warriors for freedom people who have had revolutionary contributions and have shed blood for freedom. So success attend the patriot sword that is unsheathed for thee. So in many ways, it's going back to the American Revolution. It's going back to the French Revolution. And De Rosio is suggesting that freedom does not come merely with wishes, but it has to be contributed to in terms of blood and valor and warfare and glory to the breast that bleeds, bleeds nobody to be free. So, you know, it's very interesting in the way in which De Rosio is bringing in this very idea of the fighters or the battlers for freedom. In that sense, I think, and I will make this argument later on, that De Rosio is talking about the slave's freedom as an end. But the poem is not really about the freedom of the slave. 
The poem is about the battle for this very state of freedom. And in sort of talking about freedom in general, De Rosio is talking about freedom for the women, he's talking about freedom for the country, he's talking about revolution, something that Tom Paine would be talking about. And it is this zest for freedom, free ideas that the Britishers were extremely worried about and very often would, uh, would uh, this would lead to De Rosio's expulsion from his teaching position at Presidency College with De Rosio's articulation of Tom Paine's idea of freedom from any form of government. And De Rosio saw government as a way of curbing freedom and Paine saw Revolution is the only way of curbing this freedom, of, of sort of uh, bringing freedom in. Therefore, De Rosio was frowned upon by the British government also because they felt that this zeal to bring freedom would then sort of breed a kind of nationalism within the Indian subcontinent. At the same time, you see, the conservative Hindu fraternity of Calcutta at that point of time was also extremely anti antagonistic to De Rosio because they felt that this would lead to the separation of an entire generation and a collapse of the Hindu system as it were. Therefore, De Rosio's call to freedom is a call both against tyrannical government led by the British as well as a tyrannical social order led by the Hindu patriarchs. And it is in this sense that this poem then branches out from the slave, the freedom to the slave, to the more abstract demand for freedom and the championing of people who bleed for freedom. Blessed be the generous hand that breaks, the chain a tyrant gave, and feeling for degraded man gives freedom for the slave. Now the poem started by talking about the subjectivity of the slave. So the slave as hero. But by the time the poem has come to an end, De Rosio is now glorifying all who sacrifice their lives and their work to the cause of freedom. So is then De Rosio going back or writing this poem for his young Bengal, for his zeal for his generation or his group of students? And for a group of new Indians who would fight for emancipation of women and their people from ideas of irrationality. This is a question that needs to be asked. You see, this poem is not merely about slavery and the question of the emancipation of the slave. It also becomes very importantly a uh, to ties and freedom and a validation and celebration, the transformation of the hero of everybody who fights for the cause of the freedom uh, of, of freedom, wherever you know they may be. And very interestingly, you see, De Rosio saw this fight for freedom or this battle for freedom as a global battle. You know, freedom from slavery, freedom from, for women, freedom, freedom for the nation. And in one of his couplets, he writes, where man to man the world over shall brothers be and that. So an universal brotherhood, which is marked by the presence of freedom for everybody and the the motto of the Young Bengal movement was that anybody who did not follow rationality was 
a slave. So, in a sense, therefore, this poem is calling upon a group of people to lead the battle for freedom in the face of adversity. And the slave is the recipient of this, of the fruits of this battle. So in that sense, the poem is not merely, you know, as has been read about this great moment when slavery is banned and the slave is emancipated. That's true. But the poem is also about the heroism of the people who had taken the battle for, against slavery to its logical conclusion. The poem is about all movements against government tyranny and thereby the battle for freedom. So Derosio is at the same time talking about the battle against the abolition of slavery, the American War of Independence, the French Revolution, the young Bengal movement to come, which is going to fight against the tyranny of Hindu orthodoxy and also announce the birth of a new nationalism. And because you see these radical poems which call for a sort of radical freedom that can, that can challenge and destabilize and can violently overthrow all forms of tyranny, the Derosio was both a threat to Hindu orthodoxy of the period as well as a threat to the British government who saw within this radical group the potential for a movement against the colonial government. Therefore, I would like to conclude this discussion on the freedom to the slave by arguing that there are three segments to the text. The first segment is the dramatized moment when the slave knows that he's free. The second moment is section of the poem talks about the slave's announcement of his freedom and his comparison with a large number of metaphors related to nature, including earth, birds, and of course, the air and the stream. But in the third segment of the poem, the poem broadens out to the demand for freedom in every sphere and creates as hero the people who unsheathe their souls and lay down their blood for the achievement of a global freedom. Therefore, in the seeds of this poem, we locate Derosio's fervent attempt to create around him a kind of group of people who would then be enthused by his ideas of freedom and would fight for that very cause. So, you know, if you read De Rosio's other poems, as I will do in a moment, you will find De Rosio using one metaphor. The metaphor of the bud which blossoms into a flower and the one who nurtures this budding. Derosio, as it were, saw poetry as the way through which this budding could be nurtured so that the minds of young people would be directed to the cause of freedom and welfare. So within this poem also, we notice how this very concept of freedom can be brought through. Right. So I am thereby what I'm doing here is a locating this poem as not just another abstract poem written in the mold of Campbell. But De Rosio is, as it were, trying to situate this poem within his own context. Right. It's probably time that I move on to the uh, to another uh, poem. And this is, of course, uh, the poem which many of you will, uh, the other poem in your syllabus. And this is the collected poems of 
Henry De Rosio, which is available online. Uh, it's it's an online collection which you can uh, take a look at. And you have several poems here, which De Rosio is uh, aware, which you can take a look at when you when you read. This is the poems 1827. Uh, and I will, of course, uh, look at the poems 1827. Uh, this is on the World Wide Web. So uh, all the texts of De Rosio are now available to you. Right. So uh, 1827, we are looking at the poem called The Song of the Indian, uh, I'm sorry, The Orphan Girl. Now, before I go into this, I would like all of you to remember that of all the movements of the Young Bengal movement, uh, there was particular emphasis that was given to the education of women and the, uh, the emancipation of women. Now, of course, we remember De Rosio's uh, poem, uh, The Fakir of Jangira and his poem after the abolition of Sati, where De Rosio talks about, you know, uh, the uh, the very important uh, the 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 suffering of the Indian woman and the uh, the practice of sati which lays them to waste. Of course, a large number of Derosians would later on talk about women's education, and uh, it would be one of the most important considerations of the Young Bengal movement, especially you know. Uh, many of them would go into helping Bethune uh, when the Bethune school uh, is uh, established. So uh, the degradation of the female mind was one of the major concerns of the uh, of the Derosian movement of the Young Bengal movement. And in one of these meetings, they talked about the uh, Hindu, the education of Hindu women, right? Therefore, this was one of the major concerns. So let me take a look at how De Rosio is looking at the, the condition of Indian women in his poetry. So uh, this is the first song that I will talk about, the song of the Indian girl before I move on to the orphan girl. And uh, this is a very short poem where De Rosio uh, talks about the widowed Indian girl, says, My dream was bright, but it passed away. The thought so sweet is gone, and hope hath fled like the rainbow's ray. I am left like the autumn leaf to the pitiless world and the blast of grief. So not only is Dirozio talking about the widowing of the, of the, of the Indian woman, and you'll remember that, you know, because... Brahmins had many marriages and the Kulin system, you know, young girls would very often be married to very old men and would be widowed at a very early age and their life would be immensely, you know, uh, 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 difficult, you know, both because they would be left destitute in many cases. In many cases, they were forced to live a life of great hardship and control. And very often these women were also the subject of a vast amount of lust uh, from the near ones. Many of them were shipped to Kashi. Many of them were forced into prostitution. So uh, Dirozio is talking about the pitiless world and Hindu orthodoxy, which looked at the women you know, as sacrificial kind of elements and denied them all <coughs> subjectivity. So uh, till my day of life is done, so the the pitiless world and the blast of grief, farther than the Ganga's waters roll, for my spring of joy has been brief. So either it was a life of sati, and then even then it was a life also of grief, of continuous penance and hardship of the Hindu widow, and also then of the life where you know the woman was often subject to lust and fell victim to social ostracization. Now, let me come back to the poem that we are going to talk about, The Orphan Girl. Uh, 
and uh, just give us a moment here. Yeah, this is the poem, The Orphan Girl. The text is up uh, on your screens. Uh, this is again taken from Poems 1827. And Erosio writes, she was young and fair, yet young and fair. But oh, she seemed marked for woo in this unpitying world. So you see how the word unpitying comes back and forth in Derosio's poems on women. Poor friendless wanderer. Her hair was black as a raven's wing. Her cheek the tulips you did wear. Her voice was soft as when the wind, night wings sing. Her brow was as a moonbeam fair. So Derosio is here bringing up this very beautiful image of the of the of innocence and beauty of the young uh, Indian girl. And then the moment comes of his, her orf the news of her being orphaned. Her sire had joined the wake of war, the battle shock, the shout and scar. He knew and grained a glorious grave. Such is the guardian of the brave. Her anguished mother's suffering heart could not endure a widow's part. She shrunk beneath her soul's distress and her infant parentless. So this is the girl who is orphaned at a very young age, a father dying in the war and the mother dying out of grief of widowhood. So uh, the first stanza of the poem, as it were, talks about the orphaned status of this girl. Now, it is in the second stanza that the real interest of the poem lies in this absolute destitute status of the girl and the way in which society treats her. She had no friend on this cold, bleak earth to give her shelter, a home and a heart. So the orphan girl, as it were, cast out from society completely, uh, you know, Abandoned, through life's dreary desert alone she must wend, for alas, the wretched hath never a friend. So Derosio is once again talking about the subaltern, the woman as rendered destitute, and her life being compared with the natural image of the desert. And should she stray, but that then comes the most important segment of the poem, should she stray from virtue's way? So the orphan girl, destitute, forced into prostitution or forced into rape, uh, of, uh, raped. Should she stray from virtue's way? The world with scorn and its scorn can slay. So it's the orphan girl's subjectivity versus the unfeeling, unpitying word. Now, Derosio is here drawing upon two images, one of the unfeeling world and that of the feeling poet and the benefactor of the girl. Right. So the world will scorn and scorn can slay where the body of the woman becomes, as it were, a commodity that the world will now play with and shame the girl. So patriarchy, especially Indian patriarchy, is seen as infinitely cruel to the girl in abandoning her. And then when she strays out of dire poverty, castigating her and ostracizing her from society. The world will scorn and its scorn can slay. Our shame hath enough to wring the breast with a weight of sorrow and guilt oppressed. So, Derosio sees the life of this young girl as marked by guilt, scorn, and sorrow. And thereby, he's talking about this pathetic condition of many of these young widows and women. But oh, it is coldly cruel to wound the bosom whose blood must gush unbound. No tear is as bright as the tear that flows for erring woman's unpitied woes. So Derosio is sort of deliberately drawing attention to this, to this very idea of the, the woman who has been forced into poverty and prostitution and 
has very often been raped by his near and dear ones, by her near and dear ones, and has been scorned and forced to commit suicide. So De Rosie is here talking about the pitiful condition of women in Hindu society. So this is the crux of the poem, more or less. First stanza, this, how the girl is orphaned. Second stanza, the pitiful condition of the woman and the scorn that patriarchy pours upon her. But the last two lines of the poem become important. You see, just as in the earlier poem, De Rosio was advocating heroism within the people who fought for freedom. Here also, De Rosio is calling out to blessed be forever his honored name who shelters an orphan from sorrow and shame. So he's calling out to benefactors who can adapt, adopt this young girl and prevent her from sinking into grief and prostitution and shame. So De Rosio is here radically calling for people, individuals, societies to come forward to take care of these young girls. And I'll remind you of Raja Ram Mohan also. Now, Raja Ram Mohan, when he writes this treatise about Sati, he draws upon an elaborate network of reason to sort of confront the fact that Sati is sanctioned in the Shastras. And then once he uses up his rhetoric of reason, he then falls upon the notion of Doya, sympathy and empathy. Doya. And he says, Yehadi go ke dekhiya ki apona dere doya hoi na. Don't you feel pity for them? Dirozio is here that by creating a rhetoric and a discourse of pity and thereafter is calling upon people to be motivated by pity and provide shelter to these young women. So the point of the poem is not merely to talk about the state of the orphan girl, her dejection, her despair that is there, contrasted with the pitilessness of society which will shame her if she strays. But the end of the poem is calling out to people to embrace this woman, to adapt this girl and provide them with shelter. Now this draws me to Derosio and Shelley. Why was Derosio so attracted towards Shelley? Because Shelley suggested that the poet had a special function in society and that literature had a special place in the social fabric in the sense that not only would they draw attention to any form of tyranny, remember Shelley's poem, The Mask of Anarchy or Prometheus Unbound, where he talks about the human state as a state which is dominated by tyranny, that through the heroism of certain characters, this element of tyranny could then be defeated. And therefore, the poet was, as it were, a prophet, creating a possible utopia where tyranny, pitilessness could be eradicated. And De Rosio is hereby forging, as it were, the identity of the poet and the identity of the teacher. In a sense, is looking to create a corpus of people who will not only battle against tyranny, but who will also take active steps through which the pitiful condition of the orphan girl can be reversed. And as we look at the Young Bengal movement, as I said, and the people who helped uh, Betu in creating education for women, 
Haramohan Chattopadhyay, for example, uh, and very often uh, the Radhanath Shikdar in his Mashik Potrika, who was talking about the women readers, Harachandra Ghosh and Ramgopal Ghosh, who were helping Bethune in establishing the first educational institute for women. Dirozio was therefore doing two things. He was drawing poetic sensitivity to states of tyranny and trying to inculcate the spirit of freedom through his poetry, one, and through his educational pedagogic program and building up the group of the young Bengal movement. Dirozio was also trying to create a new generation of heroes, a new generation of iconoclasts who would be sympathetic to the condition of any form of tyranny, oppression, and thereby try to create material conditions in which such tyranny could be overcome. So Dirozio's poems have a deliberate structure. They draw upon the states of subjugation, create the discourse of pity, but in the end, they call out for an eradication of this tyrannical processes and create as hero figures who either lay down their blood or who take up the cause of these young women or the slaves. So Dirozio sees poetry as a kind of a global force that can transform society together with his young Bengal movement. He attempted to create a condition of intellectual freedom and build around him a body of young men who would then radically push against orthodoxy and argue for the education of women and create institutions that would take care of them. Therefore, these poems are not merely depictions of the state of the slave or the woman. They're not merely about the orphan girl and the slave. They're also poems about freedom. They're also poems about the necessity to create conditions within which the orphan girl could be rescued and her state of shame, which patriarchy sort of casts her into, can be challenged. It is therefore with these comments that I'd like to stop sharing the screen right now. And I'd like to come back to suggesting that these poems, therefore, have a lot of implications in terms of the Indian condition and also in terms of the young Bengal movement. Thank you for your comments. Uh, and as uh, Shobinon has pointed out, yes, of course, that uh, a large number of these lines have very strong resemblances to Campbell. And that's why I was trying to show you the romantic discourse within which Drozio was writing his poems. So it is with that that I...